Okay, so welcome to this next video on the mitochondria and calcium signaling. So, so far what we've seen is that if you stimulate your cell with histamine, and this cell has histamine 1 receptors, H1 receptors, then what it's going to do is it's going to activate the GQ pathway, which will uh, produce you alpha-QGTP complexes, which will then inter uh, interact and activate phospholipase C beta enzymes. The phospholipase C beta enzyme will then uh, break up a usual constituent of the phospholipid bilayer, namely PIP2, or phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate, into diacylglyceride and inositol 1,4,5-trisphosphate. And I should mention that diacylglyceride is usually abbreviated to DAG, and inositol 1,4,5-trisphosphate is usually abbreviated to IP3. Right. Okay. What happens next? Well, diacylglyceride goes off and activates protein kinase C, but we're not interested in that at the moment. Um, we're interested in what inositol 1,4,5-trisphosphate does. We're interested in the calcium signaling resulting from this pathway. So, IP3 goes off, and it's going to bind to the IP3 receptor, which is a receptor in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum of the cell. So, let's say that this here is the endoplasmic reticulum of the membrane. So this is the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, and basically the endoplasmic reticulum is an intracellular calcium store. So it has high levels of intracellular calcium within its lumen, basically. Um, oh, sorry, it has high levels of calcium within its lumen. Calcium level in the cytoplasm of the cell is very, very low. Um, it's around um, 100 nanomolar inside the cell, but it's much higher within the endoplasmic reticular lumen. So basically, uh, we can trigger calcium signaling by releasing calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum stores, which will then have an effect on the cell. And we want to see specifically how it's going to have an effect on the mitochondria of the cell. So, uh, before we get to mitochondria, we need to see how it's going to be released, basically. So... There is a channel in the uh, endoplasmic reticular membrane which can release calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum. So this channel is known as the IP3 receptor, so I'll show it here. Okay, so it's made up of four different subunits, basically. Four different, um, four different proteins have to come together to make this IP3 receptor, and I've denoted it IP3R for receptor, but that means the IP3 receptor. Okay, so as I say, there are four proteins that make up this um, IP3 receptor. One makes up each quarter, basically. And um, the proteins that make up a quarter of the IP3 receptor, there are three different genes which code for proteins which you can use to make up the IP3 receptor. So basically, there are three genes coding for proteins that you can use to make up a quarter of this receptor. So this is what I mean by a quarter. I'm sorry, I'm explaining what I mean by a quarter to you. I don't mean to patronise. Okay, so there's a, there's a quarter of the IP3 receptor, and there are three genes coding for proteins uh, which can be used to make that. Now, you can either make an IP3 receptor where you use one of these three genes to code for all four quarters, i.e. you make four identical proteins and then stick them together. That is what is known as a homotetramer. So you can make homotetramer IP3 receptors, or uh, you can mix and match, basically. You can use different genes to... Um, you can use different genes in different sockets, basically. So you can have um, these four quarters being encoded by different genes. Now, when you do that, that's known as a heterotetramer because the uh, components of the tetramer are different, basically. Okay, right. Uh, so um, that's that. Um, oh, one more in interesting fact about the structure of the IP3 receptor. Each one of these um, quarters... Each one of these polypeptides making up a quarter of the IP3 receptors is absolutely massive. It's around 2,750 amino acids in length. So they are absolutely massive great proteins. That is a big protein. And you are making this IP3 receptor out of four of those. So, you know, you're getting over 10,000 amino acids making up this IP3 receptor. So it's a giant of a receptor. 
All right, so now what we need to do is look at IP3 gating of this IP3 receptor. So basically, if we draw the top of the IP3 receptor here, Okay, so initially what happens is the IP3 receptor is closed, so I'll show it nice and closed. Right, so what you have available, when no IP3 is bound to the IP3 receptor, then what you have available on each one of these four subunits that makes up the IP3 receptor, there is available a um, inhibitory calcium binding site. And it's not uh, necessarily in this position. This is a cartoon. This is a picture to demonstrate the point. So there is an inhibitory calcium binding site. Inhibitory calcium binding site. So basically, if calcium comes and binds to these four inhibitory calcium binding sites, uh, what it will do is it will increase... Uh, the probability that the channel is going to be in the closed state, basically. So it will, uh, it will make it le even less likely that the channel is going to open. So this channel, basically, it's a stochastic process. It can either be open or it can be closed. And there's a certain probability that at any time it's going to be open and a certain probability that it's going to be closed. So it continues opening and closing. And uh, at any one time, if you look at the channel, there's a certain probability it will be open, a certain probability it will be closed. If calcium binds to this inhibitory calcium binding site, it's going to decrease the probability that when you look at it, it's going to be open. Okay, right. Now... There is also, on each one of these four subunits that makes up the IP3 receptor, an IP3 binding site. So I'll denote this in pink. So this is the IP3 binding site here. Okay, so IP3 binding site. Okay, so basically, when IP3 goes up in the vicinity of an IP3 receptor, IP3 is going to come and bind to this IP3 binding site. Now, you've got four IP3 binding sites, so you're going to need four IP3 molecules to come in, basically. So, uh, one for each of the four subunits. And when IP3 binds to its IP3 binding site, what happens is that you change the uh, conformation of the, um, of the receptor subunit, basically. What happens is this inhibitory calcium binding site is sort of buried away. It becomes invisible. And now, what's exposed is a new binding site, which is a stimulatory calcium binding site, which I'll denote in green. So, this is an important concept to understand. IP3 does not, repeat, does not cause the IP3 receptor to open. Instead, what it does is it changes the conformation of the IP3 receptor subunit so that instead of there being an inhibitory calcium binding site available, there is instead a stimulatory calcium binding site. Okay, so you have a stimulatory calcium binding site now available when IP3 binds. Okay, now the receptor is still closed at the moment. The IP3 does not open the IP3 receptor. Instead, if calcium now binds to these stimulatory calcium binding sites, that will cause the IP3 receptor to open. So here we go. The pores finally open. Once calcium is bound to those um, four uh, stimulatory calcium binding sites. And again, you've got four calcium stimulatory binding sites because you've got four subunits, so you're going to need four calcium ions to come in and bind. Okay, so that's how you get uh, the opening of the IP3 receptor in response to IP3 levels going up. And it's important to understand that it's not the IP3 that opens it. Instead, IP3 makes available um, stimulatory calcium binding sites, which if calcium binds then, will cause the channel to open. So it primes the receptor ready to open, basically. Now, you have to remember there is calcium in the cytoplasm. It's very low concentration, but there is some calcium in the cytoplasm. It's around 100 nanomolar. So when you have um, activated your IP3 receptors by um, binding IP3 to them, you know, you're going to get potentially uh, four calcium ions binding to these stimulatory calcium binding sites, and then that will cause it to open. So for all intents and purposes, IP3 does cause the IP3 receptor to open, but it is important to make that distinction at um, a more detailed level. Right, okay, so the important thing therefore to understand is that when IP3 levels go up, these IP3 receptors open, basically. 
well, they're more likely to open. They get primed, ready to open. So if calcium comes along, they're going to open. And that's going to cause them to release calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum. So there is no electrical potential difference across the ER membrane, i.e. the electrical potential of the uh, cytosolic compartment here, so this is the cytoplasm, or cytosol is another word for cytoplasm, and this is the ER lumen in here. Basically, the electrical potential of the cytosol is the same as the electrical potential of the ER lumen, so there's no electrical potential difference across the membrane. However, there is a big concentration gradient. Calcium is high in the endoplasmic reticulum, and it's low in the cytoplasm. So, the concentration gradient favours the movement of calcium out, so you do indeed uh, get a calcium current leaving the endoplasmic reticulum and going into the cytoplasm when you open these IP3 receptors. Now, um, the uh, IP3 receptor is not very selective for calcium, it, it, and it has to not be very selective for calcium, because if it was selective and only allowed calcium to flow out, what would happen very quickly is that because calcium has a positive charge, it's a divalent cation, it has two positive charges, it's going to quickly make the cytosol more positive, and it's going to make the ER lumen more negative if you're moving calcium from the ER lumen to the cytoplasm. So you're very quickly going to build up an electrical potential difference across this membrane, where the cytosolic um, and um, electrical potential goes up, and the ER electrical potential goes down. Now, Calcium is a positively charged ion. It's going to prefer to be places which have a lower electrical potential, i.e. more negative. So that's going, that electrical potential difference here is going to start favouring calcium coming back in, basically. So what's going to very quickly happen is the chemical gradient might be um, favouring movement out, but the electrical gradient, which is gradually building up, is going to be favouring calcium moving back in, and eventually the chemical gradient and the electrical gradient will be matched, and you'll get no net movement of calcium across this membrane. So, if you allowed this to happen, you would very quickly reach a point where you could no longer move calcium out of the ER lumen. So instead, what happens is the, ER, uh, the IP3 receptor is not selective just to calcium. Instead, it's also allowing potassium ions to move through it. And basically, uh, what's going to happen is that as you move calcium out, the potassium in the cytoplasm is going to come into the ER lumen to balance the movement of charge. So it's going to act as a counter ion, basically. And you might ask, well, what is what's pulling the calcium in, basically? What is driving the calcium in? It, but, sorry, what's driving the potassium in? Is there a chemical gradient? Well, no, there isn't. But um, once this electrical gradient starts to build up, that will be moving, the, uh, driving the potassium in, basically, and it will be neutralizing the electrical gradient by doing so. Okay, so it's pulled in by the electrical gradient, basically. Right, okay, so the important thing now is that IP3 has stimulated calcium release from the ER. And basically what you're going to get is uh, you'll have other IP3 receptors in this neighbourhood here, and these will also have been primed by IP3 binding. So IP3 will have also bound to these, and they will have stimulatory calcium binding sites as well. So when you release calcium from this IP3 receptor, it's going to spill over onto its neighbour and uh, cause that one to open as well. So you'll get calcium release here as well. Now, uh, in, the in the case of the GQ uh, activation pathway that I've described, I was always assuming that you had a local um, that you had a local rise in histamine, i.e. you did not douse the entire cell in histamine. Instead, you can imagine maybe a neuron releasing neurotransmitter onto a specific site. So you're not getting the entire cell uh, covered in histamine. You're not getting activation of histamine receptors all over the entire cell. Instead, what you're getting is a local activation of the histamine receptors and a local activation of the GQ pathway. So IP3 goes up locally. So basically, this isn't going to result in a calcium wave. For calcium waves across cells, you need entire cell activation of the GQ pathway and IP3 levels to go up in the entire cell. Instead, what it's going to cause is a few IP3 receptors to be primed and ready, and they are all going to start releasing calcium through this uh, positive feedback mechanism. But outside of them, outside of that little sort of... Um, clump of IP3 receptors that have been activated and primed by the IP3, 
that there will be IP3 receptors which do not have IP3 bound. So this is an IP3 receptor over here which does not have IP3 bound. And basically, if IP3 hasn't bound, instead of having activatory calcium binding sites, it's got inhibitory calcium binding sites. So when calcium spills over from um, this IP3 receptor onto its unprimed neighbour, so this is its neighbour with no IP3 bound, it's going to ha have an inhibitory effect. So it's going to make the chance that this one's open lower, basically. So what you will get is lateral inhibition around uh, um, lateral inhibition from these IP3 receptors to their neighbours that have not been primed by IP3. So instead what you'll get is just a local release of calcium and then around that you certainly won't get a release of calcium. So that's what we called in the previous videos a calcium puff basically. So what's happened overall is you've had this local uh, stimulation of the GQ pathway by a local activation of histamine and it's caused IP3 to go up locally and the IP3 receptors which were primed by this IP3 binding have then released calcium. Uh, they've had a positive feedback effect on each other but they're also having a lateral inhibition effect of the IP3 receptors um, more peripheral around them uh, which do not have not received this IP3 signal, basically. So you get a very local um, rise in calcium, basically, called a calcium puff. It's not a calcium blip, because a calcium blip is when you just have a single IP3 receptor bound, um, IP3 receptor releasing calcium and then inhibiting all its neighbours. Uh, but it's not a calcium wave, basically. And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.